Is it Christmas already? Cause like we're getting three subclasses and one Arthur Kana. Welcome to Intelligence 14 Wisdom 2 and let's get into discussing about the Twilight Domain and the Wildfire Circle for Druids. I'm gonna cover the Onomancy uh, subclass in a later video because as I mentioned before, three subclasses. So we're just gonna do the two. So the Twilight Domain is, it's kind of all over the place. Um, with with what it is, it's it's got like bravery and and peace and defense against darkness and travel and, and I, 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 the best I can sum it up is it's defense against evil in times of darkness. Like I imagine it's I imagine it kind of like being the the good side of darkness, whereas you know the grave domain cleric is the good side of death, and then the death domain cleric is the good side of undeath is the bad side of death. However, I, I feel like the flavor text needs to, to have, figure out what the, what the one theme is. There's a bunch of themes going around, but I think they need to stick with one, like, main one. Like, this is inspiring not fear in the face of darkness, or guiding people through darkness, or things like that. But darkness is a part of this subclass. As a side note, this works very well for one of the, the goddesses in my campaign setting. Her name is Lynn Terry, and she's like this halfling goddess that, that guides people through the night, you know, tries to keep them safe through the darkness. So as noted by, I think it was Nerd Immersion, the, sub, the subclass gets fey kind of spells at level one with their domain spells. I, I get it, but I also, I also just agree that they're used for different things here, where it's Fairy fire and sleep is sleep is for kidnapping people or switching children or things like that. And fairy fire is you know fairy and fire, um, and being annoying. Um, I I imagine like sleep is hey, you rest. Don't you worry. I'll protect you. Just, you have some rest or uh, let the darkness overtake you. Or something like that. And then the fairy fire is using the what little light there is to protect you, to help you. And at later levels, this this theme uh, repeats itself where, you know, you have your auras, which are, in the flavor text, are described as light coming out from you. And then you also have, like, darkness and invisibility spells where you're bending light around you to help you. And then you also have uh, things that are useful, like Newman's tiny, tiny Hut, a good place for respite. With bonus proficiencies, this is going to be reinforced by the the Divine Strike at level 8, but basically you're going to be on the front line. You're going to have, you're going to need that heavy armor. So Eyes of Night, your first feature at level 1. So Dark Vision with no maximum range, I'm going to talk about this a bit later when I talk about the you know, mechanical side of things, but Dark Vision with no maximum range is, is basically you give this to people, that way they don't fear they don't, they don't have to fear the unknown because they can see the unknown. So either they can know, hey, there's nothing here. You don't have to worry about anything. Or, hey, there is something here, but you know where it is. We can prepare for it or maybe even avoid it. With Vigilant Blessing, I really don't get advantage on initial rolls. Doesn't seem like a Twilight domain thing. I mean, yes, Vigilance in the night, but I, I just, I'm just not feeling it. So Channel Divinity, it strengthens and calms your allies, you know, gives them, you, you're using the darkness to protect and benefit your people instead of having cause it causing them fear. That's good. Fits well with the theme, at least the, one of the themes that I have described. So with Step of the Bl Brave, it means like you're protected against fear, which is good. You're defending people against fear, so you might as well have that against fear as well. And then with flying, I, I don't get why. Why does, why does the subclass get flying? So with Divine Strike, they didn't want to go with Radiant Damage because that's more very light powered and this is low light kind of domain. They didn't want to go with Necrotic, which is the darkness damage, but it's also death damage, which is a big no. That's not what this subclass is about. So, you know, they went to the Psychic, I, that's a valid choice. I probably would have gone with like Force or something, even though it's kind of boring. But it's a damage type, so... Alright, so Midnight Shroud. This is... I, I really like this in terms of thematics. You're wrapping your allies in the Shroud of Darkness that protects you and them and has a detriment to your enemies. Instead of being afraid of the darkness, you're being benefited by the darkness. 
Very good. So let's talk about the mechanical side of these features and then we'll go on to the circle of wildfire and do the, the same pattern. So I don't have really much mechanical to say about like the, the, the flavor text or the domain spells, or the bonus proficiencies, but I do have a lot of stuff to talk about those eyes of night. Some people are taking, uh, taking just like annoyance like infinite dark vision. That seems kind of broken and it is just a little bit. So the things you gotta remember is you get it for 10 minutes um, to give to other people, but you have it infinitely. But you can do this a number of times equal to your wisdom modifier, so you can give your entire party um, at like 8th level, say, you're going to give your entire party, you're going to give everybody in your party in this infinite dark vision by like about an hour. So this isn't, this can't be abused as like you get amazing centuries and they know where everything's going on, but I mean, unless you're staying up all night, but then again, you have to deal with the fact that you're not sleeping. So it can't be abused in terms of guarding, in terms of, um, unless it's you that's guarding the thing. So the, the Dungeon Master's screen actually has uh, the, the rules, and I assume they're in the DMG somewhere. I just, this is easier to reference. That's why it's here. Anyways, it's like clear day, no obstructions. That's going to be like two miles, whereas with fog, it's going to be 120 feet. Uh, 100 to 300 feet. So, two miles of visibility, you're just going to be a better sentry, and maybe one of your friends is going to be a better sentry. However, the real problem that we get to is when we go into those dungeons, because everybody gets it for half an hour at level 1, and then almost an hour at level 8, once you reach level 8. So, how long does it take in-game to get through a dungeon? Probably less than that. In dungeons, this completely wipes out any ba dynamically lit battles that your DM has in mind. I think dynamically lit battles are cool. This subclass effectively destroys all of those, all right? And I don't think that's good. And because of that, I would I would reduce it to like, when you get 120 feet dark vision or plus 60 to your radius of dark vision. And then your friends, you can give this to your friends maybe because I, you know, I like that flavoring the theme with that. Uh, you give them like, I don't know, 60 dark vision or 120 dark vision maybe. So with Vigilant Blessing, um, two features at level one isn't common, but it has been done before. For instance, take the Grave Domain. However, this is a bonus to a skill check, which is, you know, something that the Trickery Domain only gets one feature of, which is Trickery Domain's Blessing of the Trickster, which gives them advantage on stealth rolls. I think it's t stepping on Trickery Domain's to toes a little bit. And, and also, I, like I said, I don't get why why this this subclass gets advantage on initiative. With the channel divinity, just removing charmed and frightened is a powerful ability. Calm emotions it suppresses their their those kinds of things for like ten minutes. But if they're continue going, like if the duration was an hour, then it's not going to end them completely. And then at higher levels, like there's there's the fifth level of the spell evil and good, which gets rid of that. Although I think the, the the assumed use of it is you're getting rid of possession. But anyways, I think it's too powerful to give, you know, just second level, boom, you can get rid of all, you can get rid of all frightened and charmed. Also something to note, charm, calm emotions requires concentration, whereas this does not, which, yeah, that's, that's, that is too much in terms of power. It's not unheard of for channel divinity to require concentration. For instance, trickery, trickery of domains invoke duplicity requires concentration for using it, so I'd probably add concentration to this this feature. And then the other thing that it adds is 1d8 temporary hit points. This is similar to Heroism, which adds spellcasting ability modifier. At higher levels, the spell, your ability modifier is going to go up and it's going to like um, outclass this one completely. However, this thing is an area effect, so it's low-level Heroism, but for a bunch of people. I think, like, certainly at low levels, this is a big no. So, in short, this ability is essentially a buffed version of Calm Emotions and Heroism. Sometimes these um, channel divinities are similar to spells. For instance, we go once again to Trickery Domain. Their channel of divinity, Invoke Duplicity, is a combination of Mirror Image and Find Familiar. So, it's not unheard of for channel divinities to mirror spells, but then again, we have things like, you know, Wrath of the Storm from Tempest Domain Cleric, where they get to maximize damage, which I don't think is a spell that has, is in D&D. But, like I said, there's a couple problems with it, so it needs some work. So a little rules clarification with what flying speed actually means. 
for, uh, for when they're talking about Step at the Brave, flying speed does allow you to, you know, it doesn't mean you fly and then at the end of the turn you fall down and then you can fly again. It means you fly and then you can fly. The, the hover trait that's, in, that's given to some flying creatures is you can't be knocked prone, basically. You are hovering. You are, this is, this is how you, like ghosts and things. You can't knock a ghost prone. You can, you know, knock them down, you know, through the floor. But you can't knock them prone because they're hovering, because they can't be knocked out of the sky. Anyways, so Step of the Brave, it doesn't give you a hover trait, but that does mean that you can fly about. This feature basically means when you're in darkness, you can fly. Just trade a bonus action for the flying speed and then use the flying speed instead of your movement. You just got fly at level 3, and at which point you should have 3 spell slots, so about 3 hours of flight if you really wanted it. But this one gives you infinite flight as long as you're in darkness, which again, dungeons probably going to have darkness somewhere, and especially at nighttime, if you're doing any sort of outside encounter at night, you're just infinite flying. I'd, I'd say no, because you just got fly, and now you get infinite fly, slight limited infinite fly, but no. This is, I think this is too powerful. So I don't have to, anything to say about Divine Smite, just use it as you will. But Midnight Shroud, this is a better version of the, the Shadow Sorcerer ability to cast darkness and be able to see through it. You're having a bunch of people in it. Your entire party is probably going to be in it. So in terms of, you know, melee attacks, the enemy is done for. They have disadvantage, you have advantage. But, you know, with area of effects, there are enough area of effects that you can just consume the entire place. So maybe don't put all your eggs in one basket. But even still, when it comes to melee combat, it's just completely makes melee obsolete. So I'd probably nerf some of these abilities more in order to make it more playable. I like Step the Brave, probably I'd, I'd rework that entirely. Um, there's a couple other ones. There's a couple other things that need tweakings in there, just um, debuffing, lowering it down. But overall, I like the concept at least, and, and there's some good stuff in there. So druids are played one of three ways. One, they're tree huggers and you can't uh, do anything harmful to a plant or animal. Two, they're basically were creatures where they refuse to do anything without being in, in their wild shape into a direwolf or, or a bear maybe. And then there's three ones who burn everything without regard to the fact that they're druids and are supposed to you know, protect nature. So Wizards of the Coast was finally released a subclass that works for this and this is the Circle of the Wildfire where you get to do fire stuff. So its flavor text is, ta is is talking about how fire is part of the death and rebirth cycle. It's part of the circle of life where things have to die in order for things to live. And so they're saying, hey, this is how fire works in, the, in nature. So please stay within those and don't just take this as a reason to go around burying everything. It's kind of like the circle of spores where it's it's part of the natural state of things is to consume things through you know fire and, and spores. So you're gonna see this this idea of, of death and rebirth playing a lot through the rest of the subclass. With the circle of spells, I think Nerdmarish was taking, uh, no, Davy Chappie was taking issue with the fact that we're giving druids fireball, but we've given clerics fireball and nobody complained about that, specifically the light domain cleric. So, and also bards can get it if they want. So. I don't see it as a problem that we're giving fireball to druids. The thing I do have a problem with is is raised dead at um, level nine. Raised dead, I think, doesn't quite fit with the cycle of death and rebirth. I think reincarnation from Xanathar's Guide to Everything is much better for this. I, I think the, the the just raising people back from the dead that doesn't quite fit with the theme of of rebirth as opposed to reviving. So when you summon your wildfire spirit at level at level two, you can it creates a burst of flames when it comes to life, which makes sense. There, it also it has a couple of abilities. We'll talk about those in the mechanical section, but the one I do want to talk about is teleportation. I don't see why this fire spirit gets teleportation. I think maybe it gets teleportation because, you know, hopping from tree to tree, the, the, the fire jumps from tree to tree in order to spread. But another thing I really like is you get to choose how it looks. It gives you some uh, some ideas, of course, but it's great for customability. So that enhance bond. So the wildfire acts as a battery for 
death and rebirth magic. So it fits well with the class themes. So F Flames of Life is one of the more interesting ones where you make sure that that dead body goes and joins the circle of life. And also the ability itself allows for death magic or rebirth magic. And, and you know, because it, it's, it's burning, you know, corpses, I'd love to see it in Grave Domain team up to become like an anti-paladin, anti-undead fighting group. But anyways, let's move on to Blazing Endurance, which is, it feels more like, you know, a, a Phoenix Sorcerer ability. But if you'll notice, it's got rebirth, you know, you're getting more health, and death with the area of effect. So these these two themes are present throughout all of the the um, features of this class, which I really like. Going back and reviewing stuff on the mechanical side of things, uh, you know, the flavor text and the circle spells, I don't have anything particular, but I do have a lot of stuff to talk about about that wild fire spirit. We gotta read this closely because there's a lot of stuff here. First of all, it uses your wild shape. You can either so you can either um, turn into an animal or you can summon an animal to help you out. In addition, it goes up in level with you in terms of proficiency bonus and also health. And it does a little, look a little bit daunting. You know, it's got constitution. It's constitution. Your wisdom and all five times your level. But basically, you're writing. Once you've written this down somewhere what its health is supposed to be, then you're just like adding five every time, and then when you add, when it, your wisdom goes up, you add one to that. So it seems a bit daunting, but you know, once you get it the first time, you're pretty good. So, so in, in terms of the damage output of this thing, you're basically doing a 2d10 when it, it gets summoned, and I think it's an action, so then you can use your bonus action to have it do a uh, flame seed. So you're basically doing 2d10 plus 1d6 damage, you know, at the beginning of at the beginning of the creature's existence, and then you do 1d6 as 1d6 plus like two or something as a bonus action for every turn. Now I originally thought it was 2d10 was like an aura kind of thing, so it'd be like 2d10 plus 1d6 every round, and I was like, no, but I read the rules and. You know, it turns out that it's not like that. And so this is, this is, this is similar to Flaming Sphere, which does 2d6 damage um, every round. And the first time it's an action, second time it's a bonus action. So this damage is like Flaming Sphere, but more front-loaded. Another thing to mention, um, the teleportation feature, re it's a once used recharges on rests, and then, it, so basically, once per combat. And also, it does damage before it moves, you know, bursts into flames and bursts up somewhere else, but doesn't do damage there. It's not a chase your enemies down with fire damage, it's, you know, move it into a better position ability. So with the Enhanced Bond, this is similar to the Draconic Sorcerer's Elemental Affinity, where they get to add the Charisma modifier to all damage rolls with that particular element, whereas this one adds a D8 to damage rolls with fire, which is your, your affinity, and then, da da and then healing rolls. The big thing about this is, is druids are more hardy than the sorcerer, and they're also more adaptable, so, and this feature is also more adaptable, so sorcerers, they do more damage, but they're, they're more weak, whereas druids, less damage, but also less weak. So I think this should be like a d6 or something, because right now it's a d8, which 4.5 average damage, your charisma at the time, uh, you get this feature in your corner, so it's probably going to be 4, and then you bump it up to 5 later. So I think it should be a D6 because I, it doesn't want to outshine the, you know, the Draconic Sorcerer's thing. Also, it does have a second bit, which you can cast spells through your um, fire spirit. I, I'd say if, if you're playing it well, you probably just want to do your fire spells through it because that makes sense. But, you know, you can do anything. It's basically um, making more like find familiar, which I think is pretty cool because this is basically the, the familiar subclass, like Warlock's Pact of the Chain. Although that's not a subclass. Anyways, Flames of Life, you gotta read the rules carefully. It's not an infinite battery of health, it's a once use. So either some idiot steps in it and gets burned, or um, you tell somebody, hey, go touch that, and boom, you're healed. So this, this final feature, Blazing Endurance, gets you up to full health, basically. Your hit dice is a d8, so 4.5, and this is 5 times your troop your druid level, so five for every hit dice you have. If you have like zero or plus one constitution, then you're going to go up to this. But remember, it's temporary hit points, so you still can be healed, which mm, that might be that might be broken a bit in some in some sense, because that's a lot of temporary hit points. And then it also does like a fireball's average damage. You know, 
Druid level at this point is 14, you're going to do an average of 11 damage to those 2d10, so starting off 24, average damage of Fireball is I think 28, so eventually you get to 31 damage at level 20 as, as your average. Fireball is again going to do more on the ends of things, more and less, and you're going to be more limited, so you're going to have more consistent, this is like kind of a more consistent Fireball. So basically you get uh, Power Word Heal, and then Fireball, a uh, ninth level and a third level spell. So comparing this to the other druids um, features, like the other druid subclasses, 14th level features, Circle of Shepherds has Conjure Animals cast at ninth level is what happens without a spell slot. A Circle of the Dreams has the option of three fifth level spells, which they can cast once per long rest without spell slots, I believe. And then Circle of the Moon has second level spell slot at with second level spell at will. So I think ninth plus third level is a bit too strong for the druid's 14th level ability. I what I do is I probably lower it's like I don't know four times your druid level or three times your druid level probably three. So you're not going to full or maybe it's just like you go to half hit points because this is a you drop you drop one hit points instead. So I'd say you drop to one hit points then you go up to your hit point maximum or just go up to your hit point maximum um, instead of doing the basically up to your maximum. Giving this a closer look, I actually like the subclass a lot more than I did the first time I went through. I, th I just thought it was completely broken. I'm just going to spend all this time ranting about it. But no, it's actually, actually pretty well designed. There's some, a couple minor tweaks in terms of, you know, dice and, and numbers output. But I probably, if I'm going to add this to my, you know, my repertoire of, of subclass and such, I'm probably not going to change much to it. Um, the Druid only has like four um, official ones, and then I also also have a Circle of Twilight in the back. This is actually a pretty good fit for the uh, Druid, so I, I think this this is a good subclass. With a bit of tweaking, it, it probably could be official. So if you've enjoyed this video, you know what to do. This is YouTube, you've been on here for a while, so just, you know, click all the various buttons that you feel like clicking on, or not, if you don't want to do that, and in that case, uh, thank you for the view.